So good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, I would like to welcome to the Nuclear Europe webinar on hydrogen from uh, nuclear power policy outlooks. It's meant to be the first in a series of events on this uh, very hot topic uh, in Brussels. My name is Andre Goicha and I'm policy director at Nuclear Europe. Some words about the event. Please note that um, the event is recorded and uh, I saw already a question. Um, yes, we will. Uh, we, we are thinking about making it available, the recording available after the um, event. So regarding the event, we will start with a short introduction uh, made by Nuclearis Europe Director General Yves de Bazet, followed by a presentation on policies that uh, we identify it can have an impact on the hydrogen production using nuclear energy, power or heat. And um, then we will have a policy panel moderated by Ayman Grida, Innovation and Incubation Manager at Westinghouse and Chair of Nuclear Europe uh, Hydrogen Task Force. With um, the panel will be with the participation of, of uh, organizations such as IEA, Hydrogen France, European Roundtable on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition, um, Hydrogen Europe, and um, I hope that uh, the discussions will be uh, very interesting and uh, we will raise a, a lot of questions from uh, from the participants. Now, uh, without further delay, uh, I would give the floor to the Nuclear Europe Director General Yves de Bazet for, um, for the introduction. Yves, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Andre. Uh, thank you all for uh, participating to this webinar. Um, I see there are a lot. We have a lot of registration, which show that show that basically the topic is very hot, uh, very important one, and the number of, of participants is high uh, in a very short notice. Uh, so this something which uh, somehow shows so strong. Uh, interest, strong appetite uh, on this question of hydrogen and the role that nuclear can play in that respect. Uh, at Nuclear Europe, we've tackled this issue of, uh, I would say, low carbon hydrogen for already uh, some time. Uh, we developed a, a position paper, uh, so I think it was two years ago, uh, and uh, we are now uh, have set up a, a formal and full task force to uh, tackle uh, all the angles of, uh, I would say, hyd nuclear hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen at large, because it's a relatively complex uh, issue. Um, we There are very ambitious goals uh, at EU level today, uh, and probably you have this in mind, but just to remind that from a 10 million ton of hydrogen being produced today from fossil fuel, the expectation is to grow to 20 million ton in 2030 uh, on, uh, I would say, decarbonized hydrogen. So mostly hydrogen produced by electrolyzers. So this object, this ambition is is very high. If we try to uh, convert this number in terms of terawatt hours needed to produce this. Uh, amount of hydrogen. We are talking about uh, roughly one one thousand terawatt hours, uh, which is to be compared to the three thousand uh, three hundred terawatt hours being produced today in Europe uh, each year. So it's a very ambitious number. If this uh, hydrogen would have been pro produced by uh, nuclear only, it's more than one hundred twenty reactors that would be needed to get uh, to get there. So we know though it's, it's the ambition the ambition is very high the challenge is pretty high as well there are also some uh, discussion around imports uh, from elsewhere uh, which probably is something that should uh, be considered also in our debate in our discussion in some extent um, we to to be to to be very frank, it's clear that in Europe we will always alert uh, decision makers on not falling from one dependence, which we want on fossil fuel, to another one dependence on a hydrogen import at a massive level. So this is very something we think is should be carefully considered, uh, if ever. So that's 
one of the topics, just to give uh, some example of the topics that needs to be discussed also among us. Um, I think this conversation we have in today is very uh, timely. Uh, it's also a part of very tough uh, debates. Um, I would say uh, even say some uh, battles uh, that are currently being stricken at uh, the council level and uh, the, I would say the, the, even the parliament level on how uh, accommodate the so-called low carbon hydrogen. Should it be part of the uh, of the mix, how it should be recognized compared to the rest. Uh, all those topics are uh, pre pretty hot and no later than today, we know there is, there is a, 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 a special me meeting of ministers to discuss the inclusion of, uh, of low carbon hydrogen in the gas package. So just one example of how uh, hot the topic is today. I'm not going to go much further. I think it's I will leave uh, the experts uh, discuss uh, among themselves, and I really think that we'll have a very interesting uh, debate uh, today. Uh, and uh, so I wish you all a very fruitful uh, discussion to come. And um, yeah, so I leave the floor back to Andre for uh, for the next steps. Thank you, thank you, Eve. Um, as I said, the um, uh, the second. Uh, intervention will will come from us from uh, nuclear europe i will make a presentation about about the policies and how how do we see uh, the developments of the policies related to uh, to hydrogen and what would be the impact on the low carbon hydrogen uh, category i will start with, uh, I hope that you can see my presentation. I will start uh, briefly to uh, to present our organization. So the Nuclear Europe is the trade association for the nuclear industry in Europe. We have uh, members, uh, 15 uh, associate members um, from different European countries, not only EU, but we have also um, several uh, corporate members. Currently, there are 103 uh, nuclear reactors in operation in the European Union uh, with, um, 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 with the nuclear industry having around 1 million jobs, direct and indirect impact, and the turnover is around 100 billion per year. We are currently producing, so the nuclear uh, sector in EU is currently producing 25% uh, of the electricity uh, and should be mentioned that uh, this represents 50% of the low carbon electricity in EU. And you can see what is, let's say, the nuclear uh, share in the low carbon electricity uh, across the EU member states. Having said that, I will start saying some words about uh, about the market, and it was already uh, briefly mentioned by Eve. Um, what are the needs related to hydrogen? But this picture shows the overall uh, energy market, EU energy market needs. And uh, as you can see, beside electricity, we uh, we have uh, also uh, uh, a high demand of heat industrial heat but also uh, district for district heating and of course uh, the focus of today topic uh, hydrogen uh, which is uh, which is the, the, the energy demand is uh, is massive the hydrogen matter uh, at EU level, how do we see it? I'm uh, aware about the fact that also uh, during the panel debate, um, there will be uh, this this topic will be covered by some of the of the speakers. But very briefly to to go uh, through um, through this matter uh, at EU level. So first of all, we had the hydrogen strategy uh, issued in 2020, and then uh, we had uh, the Repower EU Plan uh, 2022. In the next slides, you will see a little bit. We will have a little bit more details about uh, the ambitions set by uh, these two uh, documents. And uh, this is how we are calling um, political messages, um, setting the scene. 
Then we have the Renewable Energy Directive um, and uh, now uh, currently under review um, and the Delegated uh, Acts proposed under this um, directive and the Gas Package uh, with uh, expected Delegated Act uh, by the end of 2024. So basically th these are the core, uh, this is the core of, uh, of the legal background for of, of, on this matter. When we are talking about uh, hydrogen uh, strategy uh, issued in uh, July 2020, 2020 we were um, very happy to see uh, that um, one of the two categories proposed for, for this in this strategy uh, was the low carbon hydrogen, where we consider, of course, um, that nuclear is included as um, um, hydrogen production uh, through electrolysis using uh, the low carbon electricity uh, produced by uh, nuclear. Um, in um, but in a picture, the the um, let's say the the, the strategy is uh, aiming uh, at um, producing at reaching uh, a target of 10 million tons per year uh, of renewable hydrogen in you. So not uh, clear targets for the low carbon hydrogen category. Then we had. Um, the second um, the second uh, document um, strategic document mentioned before the repower eu plan um, and this in this uh, initiative um, it was about scaling up the production production and the imports of uh, renewable hydrogen to 20 million tons so in the strategy we had 10 million tons now uh, we we got to 20 million tons adding 10 million tons of uh, uh, imported uh, renewable hydrogen and um, there is also um, 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 an ambition about um, how the the um, uh, hydrogen consumption would look like and you can see um, here in the picture uh, how the how it it's uh, uh, it's expected the hydrogen to be used by sector in uh, 2030. Eve already uh, mentioned our uh, position paper, and we had also together with the position paper a more detailed paper on um, a background paper. The main point of uh, Nuclear is Europe, uh, in in our opinion, is that a sustainable and an economic hydrogen economy cannot succeed without significant reliance on a low carbon category. Um, so basically, uh, we consider that uh, renewables alone cannot uh, um, support the creation of this um, uh, competitive uh, hydrogen economy that uh, the policymakers uh, are proposing. And among the other points that we made uh, during our discussions with the policymakers, it was about the technology neutrality approach but also the need of uh, for classification of uh, and guarantees of origin based on a detailed life cycle assessment of the carbon intensity of the source used to produce the hydrogen but also um, the capability of nuclear um, both the large reactors but also uh, the, the the future smrs to be implemented to provide electricity for base load uh, hydrogen production and of course, it's very important, and uh, it was already mentioned by Eve, uh, the needs for targets for low carbon uh, hydrogen. And I would like also to mention here a few initiatives that uh, Nuclear Europe is participating on this topic. So we are part of the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance and member uh, of the Hydrogen Production Roundtable. We are also uh, part of the Hydrogen for Nuclear Task by IEA, but also closely collaborating with IAEA and uh, Alina will, uh, will tell us more uh, during the, the panel debate. And I, I should also uh, mention here um, that Nuclear Europe is among uh, the signatures of two letters 
um, initiated by France Hydrogen, and Simon is uh, is also here and can can uh, can say more about uh, um, about these initiatives. At the end of my presentation, I would like to say some words about nuclear and uh, energy sector integration and. I think that this figure is show um, um, very well the capabilities of nuclear. So um, the different nuclear uh, technologies, large reactors, small modular reactors, micro react reactors, or also advanced ones, are able to deliver uh, power and heat. And uh, you can see that uh, there there is a wide range of uh, applications of uh, of those energy products. And among them, very important, it's uh, of course also hydrogen. And uh, my last slide is about uh, energy sector integration. And in the middle, uh, you can see a uh, uh, SMR, small modular reactor, that can produce uh, both power and heat. And um, you can see also uh, mentioned here the hydrogen production receiving both, um, uh, I mean, using both uh, nuclear produced power, but also uh, nuclear produced heat. So as you can see, um, nuclear is having a lot of capabilities um, uh, regarding the, the, the hydrogen production. I was mentioning the initiatives and um, um, as, uh, as it was said, um, Nuclear Europe is taking this topic uh, very seriously, being involved in different uh, initiatives, and that's why we set this, um, this hydrogen task force with very active members uh, that are helping uh, uh, the nuclear sector in, um, in analyzing and providing uh, reliable uh, information regarding the capabilities of nuclear to to produce hydrogen. Um, and this event is uh, is also uh, um, organized with uh, with uh, very strong support of uh, the hydrogen uh, task force. And I would like here, uh, before giving the, the floor to Ayman, to thank him uh, for, for his involvement and his um, very uh, strong commitment uh, for this task force, but also the other members. And of course, I would like here to thank um, to, to the Secretariat, to Guillerme and uh, uh, Sophie for, for the support. And now, um, I'm finishing the, the presentation and I would like uh, to, to give the floor to Ayman uh, for, for the panel uh, discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ayman and uh, I'm very pleased and honored uh, on behalf of uh, the other members of the task force and on behalf of Westinghouse to share this uh, task force. So um, today uh, I would like to, uh, um, with uh, other panelists, we would like to talk about uh, the hot topic, hydrogen topic, uh, which is actually uh, an emerging market, uh, not only in Europe, but worldwide. And uh, I think uh, we will have a very valuable uh, panelist uh, to share with us a lot of insights. So please feel free if you have any questions to share the question on the chat and uh, we, will, we will go through, uh, hopefully we will have time to go through all the questions. Uh, let me first introduce, uh, ask the panelists uh, then to uh, introduce themselves. So we will have uh, Alina Constantin from uh, uh, IEA, based in Vienna. Uh, then uh, Bastien uh, uh, Bonnet-Cantaloupe uh, from Hydrogen France, based in Brussels. Um, Simon Pujot, uh, Hydrogen France, uh, based in France, I think, uh, Paris. And Antonio Fernandez from uh, ER. Uh, CTS, so uh, it's an European roundtable on climate change and uh, sustainable uh, technologies based in Brussels. So uh, please go ahead, uh, Alina, introduce yourself and then uh, share your slides, uh, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ayman. Um, Guilherme, uh, could you please share my slides? In the meantime, I will briefly introduce myself. I'm um, Alina Constantin. I currently work as project officer for non-electric applications of nuclear power, working in the Department of Nuclear Energy in the International Atomic Energy Agency, with my activities in the role including um, 
hydrogen production using nuclear uh, energy. Um, prior to that, I uh, worked uh, also for World Nuclear Association and World Nuclear University on various nuclear energy related activities and being involved also in organizing and implementing the leadership uh, program Summer Institute for Professionals working in the field of nuclear energy. For several years, I worked also as a researcher um, at the Institute for Nuclear Research in uh, Romania. Uh, next slide. Um. So I will start my presentation um, uh, at time and request. Um, um, I will um, um, give the global um, uh, insight on hydrogen development and also on um, uh, hydrogen produced potential uh, potentially produced with um, nuclear uh, reactors. So I'll start with um, global uh, hydrogen insights. In uh, 2022, 33 countries and the European Union have set net zero emission targets either through law or policy commitments with more than 100 countries uh, still considering them. Um, to analyze possible pathways to achieve climate neutrality, hundreds um, of uh, net zero scenarios were created, including pathway looking at the decarbonization of the economy at the global scale, as well as national level. And most of these studies foresee a, a crucial role for hydrogen in achieving net zero targets from the transport sector to, to power generation. Um, and also hydrogen can play an important um, sector integration role, enabling the integration of um, higher shares of uh, renewables. Um, as of last year, 34 countries had issued national level hydrogen energy strategies and policies. Um, to give you an indication of the extent of, um, uh, of hydrogen uh, uh, demand, the foreseen demand, um, currently hydrogen production is around 90 um, megatons per year, equivalent to about 2.5% uh, of the final energy demand uh, in 2020. And um, currently is used mainly for ammonia production, uh, the fertilizer industry, and also in the uh, petroleum uh, refining. Um, other uh, uses include methanol production and steel production, but these are um, uh, just um, in minority for now. Um, roughly three quarters of uh, this hydrogen is produced from natural gas and the remaining quarter uh, from coal. Um, and the um, uh, emissions associated with uh, this production are about um, 800 megatons of carbon dioxide per year, um, equivalent to almost 2.2% uh, um, of the global energy related um, uh, CO2 emissions. Um, IRENA, the uh, International Renewable Energy Agency, um, um, sees hydrogen covering 12% of global energy demand and cutting 10% uh, of CO2 emissions by 2050. And IEA, the International Energy Agency, estimates a global hydrogen demand increase by sixfold um, by um, 2050. Um, globally, there were um, uh, 26 countries with fully developed hydrogen strategies and another 22 in various stages of preparation as of uh, 2022. Um, as you can see, the global market for low carbon hydrogen will, um, will require a lot of investment and is um, foreseen to, to increase sharply by um, uh, 2050 in order to cope with um, climate goals. Next uh, slide, please. Um, nuclear energy is in a good position to support the envisioned hydrogen economy and can support hydrogen production through providing electricity as well as heat for um, the technologies that are considered for hydrogen production. And these are electrolysis, uh, thermochemical cycles, and um, there uh, is also uh, nuclear can supply the energy need for the most used hydrogen production process today, which is steam uh, reforming, of course, in the context of uh, climate. Um, uh, commitments, this should be coupled with uh, CCUS to reduce the associated emissions. Um, current uh, light water reactors can be used for hydrogen production using uh, low temperature electrolysis, especially using of uh, peak power or um, cogeneration for better economics, but also can be used for um, high temperature electrolysis in connection with uh, heat uh, recuperators. Advanced reactors under development um, 
Operating at higher temperatures uh, can be used for thermochemical processes that split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, however, a few countries uh, have active projects related to nuclear hydrogen uh, production um, as um, economic, some technological aspects and also licensability uh, as well as policy support have to be worked out in order to deploy commercial scale nuclear hydrogen projects. Next slide, please. Now I will emphasize a bit on the um, global developments related to nuclear hydrogen production. Um, and uh, you can see here uh, countries listed that have active uh, hydrogen projects. So um, um, Canada in uh, 2020 uh, released the hydrogen strategy in partnership with governments at all levels, industry, academia, also non-governmental organizations to identify opportunities and challenges associated with uh, hydrogen deployment. Um, and in support for the implementation of this strategy, um, Canada has established uh, 16 thematic uh, working groups, including a nuclear working group to explore opportunities for the low carbon hydrogen economy. Um, Canadian government uh, recognizes nuclear as clean energy and as part of Ontario's hydrogen strategy, Bruce Power is exploring opportunities to leverage um, uh, optimized site output for potential hydrogen production. Um, China also considers um, uh, hydrogen generated with uh, nuclear on um, equal uh, base with uh, renewable um, energy and um, uh, nuclear uh, hydrogen production is either with electrolysis supplied by nuclear power or through thermochemical water splitting in high um, temperature reactors and China is undergoing an R&D program on um, hydrogen production via thermochemical cycle with uh, their HDRPM uh, reactor that is currently connected to the grid. Um, India also investigates advanced reactor systems and technologies for hydrogen deployment, looking at, at electrolysis and thermochemical cycles, also storage, um, techno-economics uh, and hydrogen safety for hydrogen production uh, using nuclear. Um, uh, demonstration projects on uh, water uh, electrolyzers coupled uh, to currently operational nuclear power uh, reactors um, are planned at uh, selected sites and um, uh, vendor selection and techno-economic um, uh, techno uh, aspects are um, under um, investigation. Uh, Japan, uh, in Japan, um, there is a project to license the high temperature test reactor coupled to a high um, pro uh, hydrogen production plant. Um, and uh, the project will establish the technology necessary for large scale hydrogen production by JEA in collaboration with uh, Mitsubishi having in, uh, heavy industries. Um, from um, last year, the engineering works have begun as well as the licensing process by national um, regulatory authority to couple the HTTR with um, a hydrogen production facility and uh, utilize the high temperature uh, heat uh, of uh, the reactor for hydrogen production. And several promising um, hydrogen production methods, including uh, steam um, me uh, methane reforming with uh, CCS, the thermochemical um, cycle um, uh, sulfur iodine uh, as well as high temperature electrolysis uh, are investigated and down selected uh, for use in the future commercial nuclear hydrogen production with uh, HTGR. Um, uh, Russia also, Rosatom is focused on low carbon hydrogen production for a wide range of industrial consumers and um, among considered production technologies are low temperature electrolysis coupled with um, MPPs or a renewable uh, source of energy um, and also coupling steam methane reforming with uh, CCUS with um, uh, nuclear reactors. Um, UK and UK, uh, the Nuclear um, Industry Association issued a national hydrogen roadmap that foresees uh, 13 um, uh, gigawatts provided by nuclear and all types of um, uh, nuclear reactors considered that could produce 75 uh, terawatt hour hydrogen per year by 2050. Uh, UK Hydrogen Association also recognized nuclear energy as a source of clean hydrogen production. Um, very recently, UK announced that um, it is legislating to en enable nuclear derived um, fuels under renewable transport uh, fuel schemes. Uh, in this regard, the Energy Bill will um, amend the Energy Act um, 
from uh, uh, 2004 to allow nuclear derived fuels to be rewarded under renewable transport uh, fuel orders. Um, at the end of uh, last year, government commit, uh, committed to the future of nuclear power by investing uh, about um, 80 million pounds to support nuclear fuel production and next generation advanced nuclear reactors um, in the UK with um, uh, 60 million pounds um, uh, being devoted to the next phase of research into um, the advanced high temperature modular reactors and also uh, production hydrogen production using this uh, type of uh, reactors. Um, uh, Recently, EDF um, 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 announced that it's leading a consortium for the Bay Hydrogen Hub, Hydrogen for Hanson uh, project to demonstrate hydrogen production by um, solid oxide electrolysis integrated with nuclear heat and um, electricity. Um, this is an end-to-end um, -end hydrogen production um, uh, project uh, showcase, aiming to showcase um, novel technologies along the supply chain. Um, and um, hydrogen uh, is uh, aimed uh, to be used for asphalt and uh, cement uh, industry. Um, a feasibility study was completed uh, this uh, March and the possible demonstration is envisaged for, uh, for next year. Um, also, EDF, um, as you may know, um, uh, conducted a feasibility study um, a hydrogen to Haisham uh, project uh, that um, confirm the technical feasibility of the production of hydrogen using nuclear power uh, and um, it met the relevant nuclear safety and industrial regulatory requirements, including uh, health and safety uh, requirements. Uh, but unfortunately, the project did not progress to demonstrate their phase due to the challenges in developing um, a successful business model uh, without any support or incentive for end users to consume the, um, the hydrogen produced. Um, also, um, um, UK um, envisaged to um, uh, to use Sizewell C for um, uh, for hydrogen production um, and uh, to decarbonize construction at Sizewell C. A nuclear project in um, a staff work is looking to develop a demonstration electrolyzer of around two megawatt and around the sides of um, a shipping container capable of producing up to eight hundred kilogram of hydrogen per day. Uh, in US, the uh, Inflation Reduction um, Act uh, era aims uh, to systematically support the energy transition and it gives clean hydrogen um, a very important uh, role. Um, it implements a clean hydrogen production tax credit of up to three um, dollars per kilogram. Um, currently, US is awarding eight billion dollars for development of clean hydrogen hubs and the uh, DOE is waiting for final proposals uh, this April. Um, the results of the awards are expected in the fall of this year and at least one hub uh, should be based on nuclear energy. The OE has already started um, uh, teaming up with the utilities, Constellation Energy, Energy Harbor, Excel Energy and Arizona Public Service to support four hydrogen demonstration projects at nuclear um, power plants. And um, um, very, very recently, the um, Constellation um, uh, Energy Project in Nine Mile um, Point Nuclear Station uh, started um, hydrogen production um, uh, this March. So this is a very, very good news. Um, next slide. Uh, very briefly, I want to um, uh, to mention the IEA initiative to develop a roadmap for commercial deployment of nuclear hydrogen. And uh, Ayman was a very good uh, collaborator of us in this uh, in this uh, task. Um, this will be a high level publication on um, developing a roadmap for the commercial deployment of nuclear hydrogen production, aiming to provide a useful management tool for evaluating, planning and strategizing the development of nuclear hydrogen projects by interested member states uh, by taking into account the technology readiness level and time to market of uh, different technologies. And several dimensions such as economic, uh, economics, technology, um, safety and licensing, as well as stakeholder engagement are uh, analyzed in the publication and stir further for the establishing of the roadmap for the commercial production of um, nuclear hydrogen. Next slide. 
This is the final slide. I will not insist on this. Uh, hopefully you have a copy of the presentation. Um, these are the IEA resources uh, made available freely to download and to access by interested um, interested um, um, member states, interested uh, people um, to support nuclear hydrogen production. There are tools uh, um, as well as e-learning material and there are also publications and uh, um, the, uh, the most recent is a booklet um, on hydrogen production with operating nuclear power plants, um, the business case. So I invite you to, to, um, uh, to look into all these, uh, these resources that can be helpful based, uh, based on your uh, interest. Um, with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. And I await any questions. Thank you, thank you, Alina, for for this uh, global uh, perspective on on the hydrogen, uh, let's say, market uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, really, I appreciate uh, the exhaustive, let's say, listing of what's happening and where. I hope it was uh, uh, inspiring for the audience. Um, maybe a quick question to you, um, Alina, uh, as an international agency, uh, how how do you qualify the importance of qualifying uh, nuclear hydrogen uh, as a low carbon hydrogen and having a clear policy? Uh, you know, to uh, end legislation, let's say, to 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 um, to organize this type of use case. Oh well, surely I think it's of great importance to qualify uh, nuclear hydrogen as low carbon hydrogen, and I um, emphasized uh, in my talk briefly in the beginning the role of hydrogen in achieving net zero uh, targets from transport to the power uh, power sector, uh, and as well as the um, estimated increase, uh, sharp increase in demand by uh, 2050. And in this regard, um, it is essential uh, also, um, Andre and Div uh, mentioned in their talk, it is essential to adopt all uh, mature um, low carbon energy sources, including nuclear power for, uh, for hydrogen uh, production. We need to, uh, to use all is available, all um, uh, clean technologies for, for, uh, to produce hydrogen. And having um, a clear policy to qualify the nuclear hydrogen as low carbon hydrogen will definitely um, stimulate the development of nuclear hydrogen projects. And here we are talking about the interest and commitments of um, stakeholders, um, the attractivity of the investment, the development of the ecosystem, and um, also the development of the value chain industry and also the acceleration of um, of the deployment and uh, we we are seeing some developments uh, here for uh, low carbon hydrogen um, as well as the policy support um, for for its product uh, for its production even if uh, nuclear is not clearly specified yet we saw that um, um, in February this year, uh, EU had issued the Green Deal industrial plan and the US has uh, adopted the Inflation Reduction Act, Act last year to support the um, emerging green technologies markets. And it is very important that um, uh, subsidized mechanisms are, are set to, to remove uh, any blockages for hydrogen project develop, uh, developers in this uh, early stage of, uh, of uh, the emerging market. Great. Maybe a quick uh, another question before we go to uh, uh, to uh, the next speaker. Um, as an international, again, as an international organization, uh, do you see an emergent, uh, like let's say, emergence of uh, of a standard or new policy worldwide? Uh, is there a chance, let's say, to reach uh, an international standard to organize this type of use case and consolidate all the lessons learned? Uh, like uh, you, you mentioned, many geographies and many regions. Is the IEA, uh, let's say, looking on this as a emerging? Uh, uh, standard. Um, thank you very much, Amen, for the question. Um, uh, talking globally, of course, countries have their own approaches in order to achieve their climate uh, goals and clean energy. Um, however, I emphasized also in my uh, my talk um, the role of uh, the role of hydrogen for uh, for climate goals, um, and uh, we are seeing hydrogen more and more brought into discussion, into consideration, as well as into real uh, real policies by relevant decision makers, uh, by energy providers, technology developers. As as well as uh, potential uh, end users. And um, being an international organization, of course, we are looking at all these developments, particularly when it comes to the use of nuclear um, 
energy for hydrogen production um, and we we are capturing here the existing uh, existent experience the um, r d uh, we have um, so-called coordinated research projects that capture uh, relevant r d on this particular topic uh, hydrogen production using nuclear energy and also we are capturing lesson learned uh, worldwide in relation to hydrogen production using uh, nuclear uh, we will look also more into safety related aspects uh, this year we will have a technical meeting in the fall so um, when this information uh, will be available i will share with uh, with the group and you can disseminate um, broader in the being the chair of the hydrogen task force great thank you alina uh, once again so uh, for the audience uh, stay tuned uh, iea is working on a, on a roadmap for, to deploy uh, commercially let's say large scale uh, nuclear projects nuclear hydrogen projects and i think uh, it will be published somehow in uh, in in the spring hopefully uh, and I leave it to Alina to announce that when it's done. So uh, the next week, uh, uh, once again, and a reminder to the uh, I see questions on the chat. So please keep going. Uh, we won't miss uh, questions. We will go back and uh, raise the questions to the speakers. Uh, now we go to the next speaker, uh, Bastien Bonnet Cantaloupe from uh, Hydrogen Europe. Uh, now that we have seen the global perspective of hydrogen pro projects, hydrogen from nuclear projects, let's deep dive a little bit on the European. Uh, 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 situation and uh, Bastien will give us a very good uh, overview. So Bastien, please uh, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Eamon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. A pleasure to be here uh, and thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, so um, if um, the, sli the slides that I shared could be uh, could be shared with everyone. Uh, in the meanwhile, I can shortly introduce uh, myself and also uh, my organization. So I'm Bastien Blais Cantaloupe. Uh, I work for Hydrogen Europe uh, since, uh, well, three years now. Um, we are the European Association um, representing the hydrogen industry. So all across its value chain from the OEMs, the equipment manufacturer, uh, the hydrogen producers, tra transport and distributors, so the TSOs, DSOs, uh, until the very end users. So the current end users and refineries, uh, ammonia producers, etc., but also the future end users or consumers. So steel sector, uh, those that want to consume hydrogen as a heating fuel or transport sector, etc., etc. Um, we can go to the next slide, uh, which provides exactly an overview of, um, of who we are. Uh, so I was mentioning the uh, representation of the whole value chain. That's mostly the industry. So out of uh, this growing membership of over over 440 members, mostly industry, but also we have uh, EU regions, which is quite particular because it's directly the regions of public ent entities that can join Hydrogen Europe via a, a regional pillar uh, because we see regions as being uh, a very active uh, kind of public authorities uh, across Europe, not least via the implementation of hydrogen valleys. We know that French, Spanish regions, for instance, are very active, but others too. Um, and hydrogen national associations, so uh, asso national associations coming from all over uh, Europe. Uh, we have a staff also of 40 employees and very much followed on uh, social media. Um, if we go to the next slide, I can uh, dive into um, uh, today's topic. So before um, Talking about the different types of hydrogen, especially uh, low carbon hydrogen uh, or uh, hydrogen produced from, from nuclear. Uh, I just wanted to give you an overview of what is hydrogen today, what is the market like, and especially looking at the supply. So the current hydrogen supply is determined by maybe two factors that most of the hydrogen produced today in the EU uh, comes from captive reforming meaning the reforming of fossil fuels. That's mostly natural gas, but we know there is also some, some coal to gas irrigation, et cetera. But it's mostly uh, methane reforming uh, via uh, SMR, so steam methane reforming, and, and not the small mineral reactors that can be uh, used in the nuclear industry. Um, and this reforming spe uh, especially happens, takes place in central Western Europe, so in countries like uh, Netherlands, Germany, uh, but also Poland or France. Um, so you can see on this graph the biggest uh, producers and essentially most of the reforming is captive. Capting meaning uh, meaning that essentially the production takes place where the consumption takes place. So this is a particularly 
um, interesting and important feature of today's consumption, which today's goes mostly in the refining sector, as I was mentioning before, and ammonia produ production. So you typically have a big uh, SMR, so steam methane reforming plant, uh, within an ammonia producing, uh, uh, an ammonia uh, plant producing plant. Um, and if you look at the share of today's production capacity, um, that is actually merchants, that means that is uh, exchange, so the producer being the instinct from the consumer is, a, is actually very, uh, very small compared to the captive production. So you can see that merchant reforming represent 10%. Um, and um, and then when it comes to water electrolysis, which is essentially a big technology that at least uh, very many countries around the world and uh, the European Union for sure is betting on uh, water electrolysis. Uh, it only represents 0.1%. Uh, so we're really starting, at least this is only a share, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an absolute volume, but really starting from 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 low in terms of the the, the market share that will need to be conquered by this technology, maybe other technologies too, um, in order to, to to clean the hydrogen um, supply. Um, that being said, uh, we can move on to the next slide. And I talked of where we were, so giving a state of play kind of picture. And this is a slide essentially presenting you the vision that we have at Hydrogen Europe in terms of where we see the hydrogen going and where we see its role in the carbonization. Most importantly, perhaps, obviously, hydrogen uh, that is decarbonized, so renewable, low carbon, will go where hydrogen is currently consumed, but emits greenhouse gas emissions. So you will have renewable hydrogen uh, or fossil free hydrogen from nuclear or reforming of fossil fuels with a CCS technology, which is also low carbon hydrogen, that will go to replace current hydrogen used in ammonia production plants, refineries, but also more and more in other industrial sectors, perhaps where electrification is uh, much harder than in other sectors and where it may be the only way to decarbonize. Like the steel sector, for instance, there is a wide consensus in the biggest steel manufacturers around the world that hydrogen will be an absolutely key technology. I'm speaking here of a hydrogen direct production of iron ore, uh, a key technology to decarbonize um, the, the steel supply. Also, as an industrial heating fuel, hydrogen could play uh, a basically um, a key role. Um, very many sectors uh, use high-grade heat uh, uh, for the manufacturing industry. Some of this heat uh, is at um, low or medium temperature grades. Here there may be a mix of uh, electrification and indirect electrification, such as via hydrogen. But for the highest grade uh, heats, uh, we might see that it gets harder and harder to electrify directly, and uh, hydrogen might be a a very interesting technology. For instance, we are in touch with very many uh, glass manufacturers, people from the ceramics industry, etc., that are looking uh, at hydrogen and that have actually strong projects uh, to uh, to decarbonize their industries with the use um, of hydrogen. So that's on on industry only. But obviously, beyond that, uh, it will play a main role for uh, uh, the manufacturing of e-fuels that will be used in the aviation sector, for instance, or maritime. So e-fuel could be uh, e-methanol, uh, e-kerosene, etc., but also in land transport, possibly directly as for hydrogen combustion or uh, hydrogen used via a fuel cell, so with a, an electric uh, motor engine. Um, beyond that, we see very many uh, opportunities that the hydrogen economy can provide in terms of increasingly integrating renewable energies uh, in the in the power mix, providing this storage uh, storage solutions, especially for long term storage, which will be absolutely key uh, if, if if countries choose to have uh, more renewables uh, in their electricity grid, and obviously pro pro um, providing many jobs to the EU economy and uh, and energy security. So that's a bit the overview in terms of where we see hydrogen going in the future and uh, the key um, the key um, uh, advantages that it could bring to the EU economy. Going to the next slide now. Um, this is essentially to highlight that um, we are in a context of um, great geopolitical tensions. Uh, between several geographies and um, not least looking at uh, the EU, China or uh, the US, the big superpowers. 
Uh, and we have entered a race, a serious race in terms of who will be the fastest to promote clean technologies, um, to promote the carbonization technologies, where those technologies will be manufactured. That's obviously a question for electrolyzers, for instance, and for many other technologies. You can talk about solar powers, you can talk about also obviously nuclear technology, etc. Um, so a big race is ongoing and in that context, um, proposals being um, are being proposed by um, those mentioned uh, superpowers, and we know about the Inflation Reduction Act, so on the other side of the Atlantic, in the US, uh, which has very many chapters that are exactly encouraging the production of so-called clean tech on their territory. There is also obviously a chapter that looks at the production of clean hydrogen and having a, a quite strong scheme for it to be incentivized, for the production to be in incentivized with a direct tax credit based on the production that you as a producer can supply. Um, that vision is quite uh, different uh, from uh, the EU perspective. Uh, so let me explain why. In the EU, um, it was chosen to put uh, a clear emphasis on uh, renewables in general when it comes to decarbonization policy. Um, and also when it comes to uh, the hydrogen regulatory framework, at least so far. Um, and this is why in the European strategies, uh, this is highlighted. Uh, and this is why also the Commission is foreseeing uh, renewable hydrogen uh, uh, targets. We can yeah, stay on this slide. Um, but it also foresees a role for low carbon hydrogen. Uh, but let's say in a secondary instance. Um, and it has these two main categories which have which will very likely have two very different sets of rules the first one renewable hydrogen and here focusing on renewable fuels on non-biological origin sorry it's a very long acronym but essentially this is uh renewable hydrogen produced with electricity with water electrolysis and the power source being proven to be renewable energy um, and then you have low carbon hydrogen. Renewable hydrogen, we're starting to have more precisions now that two sets of legislations have been published. So it's these two delegated acts. So we're starting to see more clearly what they will look like. Low carbon hydrogen is still quite open. It is being defined in another file. We can come back to that later. Uh, and will be also defined more in details in another delegated act. Unfortunately, that comes quite late compared to renewable hydrogen. So we really see this distinction. When it comes to uh, what the US is doing, its scheme is quite different because it looks at the level of um, of kilograms of CO2 being emitted and based on this level, so here I'm only looking at the production tax credit schema, which is one scheme among others, but it's usually the scheme that's, you know, most, uh, most distracting perhaps for hydrogen producers. Uh, it only looks at the carbon footprint, so the CO2 content of the hydrogen. So that approach is uh, clearly more technology neutral because it encompasses all hydrogen, uh, sorry, all power sources uh, and all hydrogen technologies at large. So not even looking at power, but also, you know, a steam methane reformer, so based on natural gas that has on top a CCS technology, a carbon capture and storage technology. Uh, that's a clear choice. I think both come with uh, their pros and cons, and we can we can discuss discuss this later. But I just wanted to to raise this as a point of context because uh, this is this is interestingly two uh, two different approaches that were that were chosen chosen. If we go now to the next slide, um, this will allow me to go a bit um, deeper uh, in terms of the European policy framework. So beyond the two definitions or the definitions of renewable hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen, beyond that, what is out there in terms of policies? supporting the deployment of such hydrogen, um, supporting it in terms of funding, in terms of targets, uh, but also other other policies. Um, when you look at hydrogen production and transport, um, one, well, two main schemes are out there. This is the Renewable Energy Directive 3, so the revision of Renewable Energy Directive 2, we call it the Red 3, um, and it sets binding targets for those so-called RFNBOs that I mentioned. So renewable hydrogen, um, of which the power source is renewable. It sets binding target on industry and transport. This uh, legislation is still draft, 
uh, it will be or should be finalized very soon. Uh, there should be actually a normally last trial, I think, in two days on this, uh, and we can come back to the targets. But essentially, the original proposal really focuses on our FNBOs uh, finding targets. Um, then you have a set of other legislations, uh, refuel EU aviation, so for decarbonization of the aviation sector, also with targets of the fuel supply. Uh, and fuel EU maritime, which is a bit different here because it looks at the greenhouse gas uh, emission savings, but also with a specific quota for RFNBOs. Again, uh, these uh, are also open, especially the refuel aviation, uh, and low carbon hydrogen could also play a role there, depending on how the negotiations go, just like under Red 3. What is sure, however, is that the gas, uh, hydrogen and gas package, so that you can see above, uh, will be uh, the main framework for the definition of what will low carbon hydrogen be. And the European Commission so far, and um, um, in the current exchanges, this is at least the way that it's uh, the direction that is being taken by co-legislators. This will be the place where low carbon hydrogen will be defined. Uh, possibly we will see also targets being implemented there. The work that is being done under the Renewable Energy Directive will influence what is being done under the gas package, of course, but this is where you will find the framework, the regulatory framework for low carbon um, hydrogen. But beyond that, I just wanted to mention that there are some other um, regulations that are very much relevant for hydrogen and also for low carbon hydrogen. Um, the ETS and CBAM is one of them. Uh, ETS is a revision of the current version of the carbon markets. Uh, and CBAM is a new is a new t is a new regulation that complements the CBAM uh, that complements the ETS. Sorry, and ETS is really only about decarbonization focus. So it doesn't look at types of hydrogen. It looks at the carbon content. So the ETS in the major incentive that it will give via the carbon cost uh, to uh, reduce emissions from industry, but also now from transport and from an increasing amount of sectors, will give a strong incentives to go for pathways, processes that are less decarbonized, that are less carbonized. Um, so hydrogen, be it renewable or low carbon, will indeed clearly be incentivized via those regulations. Um, and I can also maybe uh, mention two uh, important pieces of um, uh, of the regulatory framework, which took more at financial support. Here we have an interesting initiative from the European Commission. I can maybe dwell on that more in the in the questions part, but the hydrogen bank that will be a major European tool to fund, uh, possibly in the beginning, hydrogen production. Let's see how it goes in the next wave, but for now this is the signal that we have. And the IPSAs, essentially I want to say IPSAs, um, but state aids in general, so IPSAs and important projects of common European interest. It is just one of the very many state aid tools that are out there and that are also available for the support of the production, the consumption of both renewable and low carbon hydrogen. So I just wanted to give you a picture of perhaps the main regulatory pieces of this massive and quite complex regulatory framework that is out there, and those that are, would be particularly interesting and relevant for, uh, for low carbon hydrogen. Um, now, if we move to the next slide, uh, and that's it. I, I end here, so uh, I'm happy to take any uh, any questions. Thank you, thank you, Bastian, for this uh, uh, very uh, informative, uh, let's say, uh, overview on uh, on the situation in in France and uh, in Europe, let's say, and the explanation and the comparison between the uh, United States and and uh, and uh, Europe, because it's a little bit confusing to hear IRA uh, happening in United States and it's straightforward, etc. So people are questioning. Uh, what might come in Europe. So maybe a quick question to you and then because we don't have, a, um, I think we have only, we still have two speakers with the presentation and the slides, but a quick question to you, uh, Simon, and I have questions from the chat as well to you. We will go back to that question as well. Uh, but a quick question, uh, we have heard a lot of plans in Europe. You explained that, but what would be the impact of those plans on the domestic, uh, let's say domestic uh, production uh, comparing to, uh, to, uh, to, I mean, is it enough, let's say? Those all those measures and the mechanism that the, has been announced so far. Um, so it's it's um, it's probably not enough if you compare the legislations that are presented there uh, with the ambitions that perhaps I didn't mention enough, but of the repower use. So repower use strategy is a strategy that follows, as you mentioned, 
the hydrogen strategy and more particularly the Russian invasion to Ukraine, which aims to scale up essentially a lot of things that were announced before. So that's the same for hydrogen in terms of hydrogen production, domestic and also imports. Um, we're looking at 10 million tons of production in the EU. This is absolutely massive, uh, not only for the production, but you will also need the manufacturing capacity of electrolyzers uh, in the EU. So that's actually something that's very much relevant both for RFNBOs, renewable hydrogen, but also for low carbon hydrogen, so-called fossil free from nuclear. You will need this electrolyzers capacity um, and you will meet several challenges in terms of the supply of critical raw materials. Here, the CRMs Act is particularly relevant for the EU to be able to source its critical raw materials to manufacture at home the electrolyzers. You will need the fluoropolymers for the membranes of PEM electrolyzers, for instance, but other technologies. Here, the PFAS restriction proposal could be quite harmful depending on how it's shaped uh, for the manufacturing and the supply of fluoropolymers. So I'm talking here of the membrane, which is the core uh, component of the electrolyzer. Um, so there, there are very many challenges that the electrolysis industry and the hydrogen industry in general will face in order to meet these targets. Uh, we as the hydrogen industry are very happy, obviously, that the targets are out there and are ambitious. That's really something that we welcome. However, we will need to see the right funding framework also, and uh, we can come back to the hydrogen bank question, because really uh, we will need to make massive efforts in order to reach these targets. They are very ambitious. So I, I stop here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Bastian. My, my second question uh, is, is uh, we have heard uh, recently, let's say a week or 10 days ago, uh, about uh, the hydrogen bank in Europe. So can you tell us a little bit uh, in a in few words uh, what it's about and uh, how, how this might uh, help developing, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the market? And uh, does it include, let's say, clearly, or, or let's say, it, does it, will it include uh, in future uh, nuclear? Yeah, so very quickly, Hydrogen Bank uh, is not a typical bank, uh, so it's it's a, it's a funding scheme, huh? not to be mistaken. It's, it's a funding scheme that was announced quite recently, uh, also perhaps as a reaction to the IRA, amongst several reactions, uh, in September in the State of the Energy Union by the President of the European Commission. Uh, since then, the relevant departments of the European Commission have worked on the concept. And essentially what you need to remember is that you have two legs, one domestic leg and one international leg. The domestic leg is managed by DG Klima and aims to foster the domestic production of hydrogen. Uh, it will probably be done via a fixed premium, so a fixed amount of money that you receive as a hydrogen producer. The international pillar will look at hydrogen imports to complement why what we will need in Europe, but what we may not be able to produce in Europe. So it will look at cooperating with imports with, with foreign countries for hydrogen imports. On the question of which type of hydrogen, um, at Hydrogen Europe, we're very much in favor of having uh, a scope uh, that's large and because it, it will be funded partially by the EU ETS, which is about decarbonization. So anything that participates in decarbonization should definitely be covered. So renewable and low carbon should be in. However, the first impression that we had from the European Commission, at least in the first calls, so where the money uh, will be given, I mean, when the projects will bid at least, this autumn, it might only cover renewable hydrogen. Uh, there will, there is indeed a problem of we will, we will not have a definition of low carbon hydrogen by then. So that's that's also an issue. But we understand that the first wave might concern only renewable hydrogen, and then in the second, perhaps low carbon. But it's still to be defined. At least this is what we would support. Okay. Thank you, Bastien. Uh, apologize if I had to rush a little bit because the time is running. And we still have two uh, two uh, very valuable speakers to to share with us some a lot of insights. So let's go ahead and uh, and go to Simon. Uh, now that we have seen the global and the European uh, perspective, I would like to uh, Simon to share with us the French perspective and why France, because France is advocating uh, publicly and actually uh, really very uh, they are very actually very much advocating for the nuclear hydrogen to be uh, part of the European uh, roadmap. So please go ahead, Simon. You have ten minutes. I will. Uh, I will be All a little right. bit uh, timekeeper uh, for the last two ones. Sorry, but guys, to keep uh, to take the question. Okay. Many thanks for the kind uh, an invitation, Amen. So um, in 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 two words, I'm Simon Peugeot in charge of public uh, mm -hmm. affairs um, for France Hydrogen, the French National Hydrogen Industry Association. Uh, I'm in charge of public affairs for both national and uh, European uh, uh, pieces of uh, legislation, and so. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to present 
very quickly. Um, Francis Rogen. Uh, yeah, just to finish to present myself, uh, I have a thesis on uh, which compares the organizational strategies uh, for innovation between the on between the US and France on uh, small modular reactor and fourth generation uh, reactors, and I come from the photovoltaic sector. Um, so about France Hydrogen, we are the French uh, National Hydrogen Industry Association, which gather uh, soon uh, 500 uh, members. I did not update uh, the, this slide, but now we we are close of the 500 uh, members with uh, groups, uh, big groups, and intermediate companies, SMEs, uh, regional and uh, local authorities, and also um, all the research and academic uh, institute in France, which are involved uh, on um, on hydrogen. And just to, to make the, the link with uh, Bastien, uh, the presentation of, of Bastien, we are member of Hydrogen Europe, and we sit uh, at the board of Hydrogen Europe as uh, a representative of um, of the national uh, association. Uh, next slide, please. And yes, ju just to finish with a brief presentation of France Hydrogen, uh, we are the, um, uh, the largest national uh, hydrogen industry association uh, in Europe. Uh, if we talk about um, the number of people in the staff, we, we are 18 uh, today. And uh, yes, we cover the whole value chain and uh, our basic goal is to accelerate the development of renewable and low carbon um, hydrogen uh, to decarbonize and reindustrialize. Uh, next slide, please. So about uh, the French uh, vision, I'm not going to present the whole uh, French hydrogen strategy, but um, in two words, French hydrogen production project and the political strategy which is behind it, they are mostly based on electrolyzers located close of the final off taker and connected to the electricity grid, uh, working with a very high load factor. And this is something, this connection to the grid, this uh, this very high load factor, more than um, 7,500 um, hours per year. This is something which is allowed because we have in France uh, uh, an, an electricity mix with a very low uh, carbon uh, content, thanks to both nuclear and uh, renewables. This high load factor is a really a, a major national competitive advantage for the ramp up of hydrogen because it allows quicker return on investment, of course, but also, and maybe it is the most important uh, in this framework, it allows a reduced infrastructure need because electrolyzers can ensure by themselves a steady supply, uh, which is crucial for the, the final industry of takers. And so, we have uh, indirect recognition of nuclear in the EU pieces of legislation. These two indirect recognition or in the delegated act on RFNBOs that uh, Bastien mentioned, uh, there is um, an exemption for French project which will not have to comply with uh, some criteria, both the additionality and absence of state aid uh, support because we have a low uh, carbon uh, electricity grid. Second, uh, indirect recognition for the electricity mix, which have uh, average carbon, carbon contact content, which allows to produce hydrogen, um, low carbon hydrogen. Um, we have, um, yeah, there is a, a mistake in, in the slide, but uh, production can be qualified as RFNBOs in proportion to the share of renewable energy in the electricity mix two years before, so 25% in France. And finally, we arrive to our nuclear hydrogen. Production can be qualified as electricity-based hydrogen to the share of nuclear electricity in the mix uh, two years before, so between 65 and 70% uh, in France. We, we mentioned the definition of low carbon hydrogen, which must arrive in the uh, delegated act coming from the, the Article 8A to the Hydrogen Gas Directive. But for electrolytic low carbon hydrogen, there is this first definition in the post uh, kiv state aid. And this is crucial to have a better recognition of this model, electricity-based hydrogen, to produce uh, hydrogen without extra costs um, and uh, in an optimum way uh, for the system. Uh, next slide, please. 
and so it was mentioned uh, before by, by Bastien, but to us, the, the key pieces of the EU framework on hydrogen is about target. And we have two uh, different uh, level of target. First, the revised renewable energy directive, which gives a signal for 2030. And for this year, 20, 2030, we have to find a way, uh, because there will not be new uh, nuclear power plants uh, by then, a way to uh, encourage um, the development of new renewable capacities of RFNBOs while maintaining a kind of recognition of nuclear hydrogen. And this is the denominator proposal, which is very technical, that we that we proposed and we advocated for in a draft letter in March that uh, Nuclear uh, Europe uh, signed with us. And then there is a long-term signal, notably with refuel EU aviation, which will set mandates, mandates for the use of e-fuels until 2050. And I just precised uh, the different proposal of the Commission of the Council of the Parliament. And here we are in a decisive uh, step of trilogue and we can get a win-win final compromise if we refer to the, the ambitious mandate, which is uh, set by the European Parliament, but by including low carbon e-fuels, or since we talk about a signal until 2050, about uh, nuclear-based uh, uh, e-fuels, uh, not to include uh, fossil-based hydrogen and its derivatives. And on refuel EU aviation, it will be key to not to repeat the same mistake than in fuel EU maritime, where the final compromise uh, that was achieved uh, last week was, yes, not ideal, for the recognition of e-fuels. And uh, by recognizing the complementarity between nuclear and RFNBOs, maybe we could have done uh, better. I stop here, I already. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Simo. Uh, I appreciate uh, that you were uh, actually uh, keeping uh, yourself uh, on time. Uh, maybe uh, I, I see a lot of questions. I invite the other speakers, please go ahead the questions. And if you can answer directly, that would be great. So we don't uh, leave those questions without answers. But quick question to you, uh, uh, Simo. Is there any demonstration projects happening in Euro in France uh, currently? In one minute, please. Yes. Yeah, sure. We we have to to make the difference between two levels uh, of time. First, about uh, electrolysis based on the grid. Uh, in France, we we just collected uh, last year France hydrogen uh, projects in the pipe represent more than one megaton of decarbonized hydrogen uh, production projects uh, by 2030. So it's really huge, massive, and it is really based uh, mostly on electrolysis and electrolysis with a very high load factor. And I just make the, the relation with um, a question that was uh, set in the, in the chat uh, about the, the possibility to make PPAs with nuclear uh, yeah. base power. It is possible. In France, uh, there is a, a model which was made for steel for aluminum. Uh, that is called Excel, Exceltium or Exceltium 2. Uh, and it was extended uh, to, uh, to electrolyzers. However, we need to have a, a balanced, a good uh, recognition of nuclear hydrogen in the EU framework to activate uh, this level of the power purchase agreement with hydrogen. But yes, uh, it is possible. And just to finish about the demonstration project, uh, in a second time, uh, we plan to to develop maybe uh, small modular reactors uh, to have yes direct uh, direct coupling with uh, electrolyzers to make uh, high temperature uh, solid electrolysis um, projects uh, in France within the industrial zone, especially with a small modular reactor New World, uh, which should uh, enter into force by 2033. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Simon, uh, for those insights. Um, I hope we will have time to go back to the questions. Uh, let's go now to uh, Antonio, our uh, our last speaker. Uh, Antonio is uh, from the European Roundtable uh, Climate Change and Sustainable Technology. I I I learned the word. <laughs> uh, so the floor is yours, Antonio. Please introduce yourself and share your thoughts. So it will be an agnostic uh, uh, perspective of what's happening and what's missing. So please go ahead, Antonio. Antonio? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. No, I was apologizing for the long name, the European Roundtable on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition. So you almost got it right. <laughs> but 
Uh, that was a, a great effort. Yeah. So my name is Antonio Fernandez and I work as a policy analyst uh, at ERCST, which is a think tank based in Brussels and we work on, on policy and regulatory analysis. Uh, the core of our research in the last years have been mainly ETS and CBAN, so carbon pricing. But in the last two, two years, we have launched uh, new work streams, one of them on, on, on hydrogen, where I mean, I have been working for the last two years with the support of, of a senior, of my senior fellow, Olivier Imbo. And uh, yeah, if we will go to the to the next slides. I can show you quickly some of the examples of, of the of the work that we produced. So in the last month, we have looked, for example, on the inclusion of hydrogen in the EU CBAM with support of many stakeholders, including Hydrogen Europe and Bastion. We took a lot of comments from them. Um, also, we have assessed the Repower EU uh, ambition for hydrogen, the aspirational target of 10 uh, million tons of uh, imports by 2030 from different angles as, and, and perspectives. But I, I'm not going to extend myself further than this. this. This is just to give you a flavor of what we do. And now we can go to the next slide. And I think we have been talking a lot about low carbon hydrogen and nuclear uh, uh, power, uh, nuclear hydrogen. And I think it's, it's important to, to clarify where does this fall under, under the current definition framework that the European Commission and the other institutions are creating. Because we will have a binary definition in Europe, so we will have a definition for RFMBOs and we will have one for low carbon hydrogen. And for me, there are three key elements of definitions. One of them are uh, a percentage that has to be applied to a fossil fuel comparator. And applying this, so A plus B, we get to an emission redu reduction threshold that in this case will be the same for both. It will be 3.384 uh, tons of CO2 equi equivalent per ton of hydrogen, right? Uh, and then we need another element that is a methodology to assess the carbon uh, footprint of the GHG footprint of the production. That this will come in, in a separate delegated act. Uh, the difference here is that for RFMBOs, there are two main uh, different requirements. Uh, some of them are um, presented or were presented in the delegated acts, including additionality, temporal and geographical correlation and so on. But the main one is that the RFMBOs come from renewable sources other than biomass. So um, in this case, hydrogen produced uh, from nuclear power will clearly fall within uh, the low carbon hydrogen definition because it will meet this emission re reduction threshold that we get, get from applying the percentage to the fossil fuel comparator. What's the problem here is that this is still shaping. Why? Because I don't know how much familiar you are with the, with the EU process, but as Bastian mentioned, there is one directive called the Hydrogen and the Carbonized Gas Directive. And we have a Commission proposal, we have a, a European Parliament position, but we are still awaiting the, the Council position. So if the, trilog the trilogs have not started yet, so um, that's what we think uh, the, the definition will uh, look like, but we don't have any certainty yet uh, for this. The, the renewable hydrogen definition is a bit more advanced because uh, trilogues are concluding, the delegated acts have been proposed, and now is the parliament and the, and the council that are scrutinizing them. So that's um, in, uh, in a nutshell, um, the definition framework in the EU and where the the hydrogen from, from nuclear power will fall. Um, then we go to the next slide. And I think if we can, yeah, I think this is this is quite relevant for, for our session today, because I mean, we are a think tank, we are agnostic, but we have our ideology and we uh, support a technology neutral and a market driven ramp up of the hydrogen market. And I think these are very three very simple arguments that uh, I think it's good to bring forward about why do we think this would help the, I mean, to apply technology neutral approach will help, help the market uh, ramp up. And first of all, it's, it's, it's because industrial cons consumers of hydrogen need a constant uh, hydrogen supply for their production processes. And this is 
extremely important for the steel sector, for the chemical sectors. And if you if you connect, of course, a renewable uh, installation directly to an electrolyzer, uh, due to the intermittency of, of renewables, you may have, you uh, may end up in a situation in which you can or you you are forced to stop production, and uh, this of course something very detrimental for for the, for for some industries. Uh, also, because renewable hydrogen may be scarce and therefore expensive during the transition, and the 500 terawatt hours of renewable uh, electricity needed to produce 10 million tons of hydrogen were already mentioned. That equals half of the of the uh, renewable uh, power produced uh, in 2019. So to to deploy uh, the same the same amount of energy. Uh, in six years, sounds quite quite ambition. So we may end up in a situation of a scarcity, and a scarcity will lead to higher prices, and higher prices will be detrimental for our industry, for the EU industry, to remain competitive in a global market, especially in light of incentives, as the incentives we have uh, listened to, like the Inflation Reduction Act and others in other juris jurisdictions. So. And then um, the issue of imports and to what extent uh, the EU should rely on imports of hydrogen or not. I mean, we support a, a, a EU hydrogen market uh, made in Europe. And uh, for this, we uh, support the contribution of uh, hydrogen from nuclear power because it can help us reduce dependencies. We have listened as well today the argument of the interest change of, of dependencies. Uh, we don't. I think it was one of the aims of the Repower EU. So I, I, I don't think we we want to repeat that. Of course, you cannot compare hydrogen with natural gas because natural gas. Uh, normally, is bound to the geographic place where the, I mean, where the where the natural resources are located. While well, hydrogen, you can delocalize more freely, as the input can be delocalized. But there is another important argument uh, that relates to how to make sure that the uh, hydrogen imported has a low uh, carbon foot footprint. And the EU will uh, set up voluntary schemes for certification, but. From a theoretical level, they will apply the same standards to imports than to domestic production. But from a sort of pragmatic side, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to make sure that uh, these voluntary schemes are uh, trustworthy and, and how are you going to audit producers in, in some countries and so on. So if, you, if we go to, to, the next, uh, to the next slide, please. I'm going to go very, very quickly through this because uh, it has been already touched upon by Bastian uh, and other, and other speakers. So this is just uh, the regulations of, I mean, excluding policies that touches upon uh, low carbon hydrogen, and in this case, uh, uh, hydrogen produced uh, from nuclear power. Uh, most of them, I think the support is in, form, is in, in a form of uh, implicit support because most of mentions are for low carbon hydrogen, but we can't assume that uh, the, the, the hydrogen produced by nuclear is already included in, in, the, in the low carbon hydrogen. So I, I'm not going to elaborate any further on this, so we can go to the, to the next slide. So in the previous slides, we, we, we saw a lot of places where low carbon hydrogen is included in the legislation and so on. But for me, it's important to clarify one thing, and it is that it is difficult to compare the effectiveness or the, yeah, the suitability of incentives for different nature. No? You cannot compare standards with binding targets, with carbon pricing, uh, in shaping the behavior of the market. So what is clear is that the, 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 the real incentives we, that has that have a capacity to affect market behavior uh, have been introduced as part of the Renewable Energy Directive uh, in the form of binding targets for the industry and the transport sector. And those are the real targets that, that will really shape uh, where uh, hydrogen uh, off-takers will, will want to, 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 to own the form of hydrogen that they want to purchase. The, their, their hydrogen, right? And for instance, because the industrial consumers that are the ones that will bear the target of 50% of renewable by 2030, 
will be the ones probably the, being the first using hydrogen. So during the first years of the of the hydrogen uh, ramp up. So that's that's quite key. And uh, so we think that additional demand side support for low carbon hydrogen should be considered. And we can go to to the next slide. That's the, the last one to, to finish on time. Um, there are some possibilities. We we are not saying which one is better than the other. We have thought about that, and I think we have different ways in which we can provide low carbon hydrogen also with a demand side incentives. Uh, here are some ideas. So we could make some elements of the renewable or RFMBO definition more flexible during a transition period. I think this this uh, has already happened, and in the last publication of the delegated acts defining the, the requirements for electricity to be uh, considered renewable, we see some flexibilities, for example, in the in the temporal correlation or in the time and the time frame for additionality to apply. So this we can argue that this can be already this has been already taken into into consideration. Then we could make low carbon hydrogen in some form account towards the renewable energy targets during a transition period. It's under an ocean. It's being explored now. Uh, of course, the introduction of the demand side mandates for low carbon hydrogen in the, in the hydrogen and gas uh, directive is another option. Um, as well, expanding the scope of support of the hydrogen bank to low carbon hydrogen. As Bastien mentioned, they will start with auctions uh, that will lead to a premium, a green premium that just renewable hydrogen producers will, will be able to get. So maybe we could expand the support as well to low carbon hydrogen for further options or reduce the uh, the, the the ambition for 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 the binding target that we have in the red and uh, reduce this 50 percent of rfmbos and move it to to 40 to 30. Um, i think the um, after the, the the last trial the last consensus was about 42 percent so those are the the, the um, some of the alternatives that we have to to support low carbon hydrogen that we really think um, is needed to to help the the market to ramp up in the transition period. So that's all. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Antonio. You are just on time. Um, thank you for those insights. Um, uh, I, I hope uh, it clarified many of the questions I have seen in in the in the chat. Uh, thank you also for pointing what's missing in the. Whether, whether uh, was it enough or not from, uh, let's say, a think tank perspective. Um, uh, I actually have a lot of questions, but I we only have one minute left, and I would like to get that minute to thank all the participants, like uh, whoever registered for this uh, event. Thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you uh, to the speakers, uh, Alina, uh, Simon, um, uh, Bastien, uh, Antonio, André. Uh, thank you to uh, Yves, who, uh, who, uh, who uh, shared uh, his thoughts with us. I also would like to thank all the members of the Hydrogen Task Force uh, for the efforts and the support. Um, just quick information to uh, to the participants. Uh, uh, as soon as we finish this uh, uh, webinar, you will receive a, a survey. So please uh, uh, take a few minutes to, to share with us uh, feedback. Uh, we would like to have other series of uh, webinars, uh, more maybe oriented, technical, and hopefully some uh, events on face-to-face -face, uh, uh, by the end of the year in Brussels. Uh, my last uh, uh, word is uh, I would like to thank Guillermo and uh, Sophie uh, for their valuable support and uh, really hard work. Thank you all. Um, I don't know. Um, apologize. I think we could not take all the questions uh, from the chat. Uh, uh, an hour and a half was not enough, uh, clearly not enough. Uh, but hopefully in uh, the few uh, webinars to come, uh, we will uh, we'll, uh, make sure that we don't miss questions. Uh, OK, so I think uh, from my side, uh, uh, I enjoyed it. I learned so many things. Uh, although I'm 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 deep diving on this uh, uh, topic, but I'm still learning. So uh, thank you all uh, the panelists for their uh, insights. With this, a lot. I think I think with this we will uh, we will end our event. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you all. Uh, enjoy your day and uh, stay tuned for uh, for other information coming from the Hydrogen Task Force. Thank you.